And as people come in, if you guys want to open up your iPads and type in that tiny URL, tiny URL backslash Beth L Lori six. Okay, then we'll be ready to get started as soon as you guys are ready. Tova, can you adjust the microphone a little bit for me? You guys are sounding a bit garbled. We are? Yeah, you are. Um, okay. So speaker, we want it. Okay, that's oh. right there. That's Wait. Okay. Wait, is that better or worse? Much better, much better. Okay. Great, fantastic. Okay, guys. As soon as, as soon as you guys come in, I'm going to ask you guys to click on here. Remember the topic that we're studying now or that we're going over last class on this class is what does it mean that Israel is the Jewish state? So I'm going to ask each of you to click in here. You're going to come to a Google document, a Google form. And I'm going to ask you, this is all really review, thinking about what we went over last week. What types of things can Israel do on Shabbat? What do you think about the government telling Jews how to observe Shabbat? What surprised you most about marriage in Israel? How would you feel if the U.S. government told you what your wedding needs to look like? And what types of things can Jews do in Israel on Shabbat? And then you'll click Submit. So as soon as you guys are in, you can start working on this Google form. What can we do that can't? So what can, what types of things can't Jews in Israel do? It's like what, what can't Jews do on Shabbat? Right, the questions are really things that you guys are gonna answer on your own and then we'll come back together and we'll look at the responses. So the first question is, what can't Jews do on Shabbat? What do you think about the government telling Jews how to observe Shabbat? Shani, you got it? It's, you're going to click through the, the first link right here. Everyone got it? Great. Like you need people who like, observe it, can't you? No, no. Guys, we went, we did a whole class on this. So this is really, it's what you think. You guys answer what you think. We'll talk about the answers and the questions after everybody's done. We do have a couple of people that weren't here last week. So there's- Ah, okay. Then it'll be a little bit confusing for you, but then we're gonna talk about answers and questions. So it's, it's pretty much, we talked about last week that the government in Israel there, there are, the government says that stores can't be open, that public transportation can't run, that movies, theaters can't be open. It depends on where, but those are policies set by the government on Shabbat. And it's a big controversy. And today we know there's a little bit more freedom or leeway in individual communities and cities to decide how they'll observe Shabbat. So like if you're like 20 and you're in the college or whatever, you choose to get married, they give you a discount so they want you to get married younger? Do you know what I realize? <laughs> like, Keep filling it out, guys. We'll discuss it. Keep filling it out. out. And then we're going to discuss it. And we're going to pick up again with the, with marriage. Okay. So in, can you can I, can you raise your hand when you're done filling it out so we can gauge? Click submit when you're done, and then we'll be able to see everybody's responses. Okay, so two of you have finished so far. I should have five responses. Yeah. Okay, guys, so the last couple of you. All right, two more. All right. 
Awesome. We're waiting for one more person. Okay, we're going to give it another 10 seconds and then we're going to go ahead and look. Oh, great, awesome. We're all in. Okay, responses. So, what kind of things can Jews do in many places? So, 80% of you saw go to the movies. That was a big controversy we looked at last week. Protest by yeah, the right. Haredi Jews to make sure movie theaters are closed in Yerushalayim and protests on the part of other Jews who want options and non-Jews to make sure movie theaters are open. And just to tell you, there is now, of our major, two major multiplexes, one is open on Shabbat in Jerusalem. Go clothes shopping, that is for sure. Clothing stores are closed on Shabbat. Go out to lunch, restaurants are closed on Shabbat, with very few exceptions, and travel by public transportation. Traditionally, Public transportation has been closed on Shabbat. But as we looked at last week, even that is beginning to change and communities are beginning to be able to vote on if they want to have the Supreme Court rule that communities can determine that they want public transportation. Okay, this was a much more interesting question to me. What do you think about the government telling Jews how to observe Shabbat? So one of you thought, Israel's a Jewish country, the government should tell people they have to observe Shabbat. And that is a thing, meaning there are many people who feel like even if they personally don't observe Shabbat, that in the Jewish country, Shabbat should be observed. People shouldn't have to go to work on Shabbat. And that should be a day of rest. Okay, Israel is also a democracy and government should stay out of religion. Interesting to me that none of you um, chose that, but there are people, Israelis, who feel that way also. And Israel needs to be a Jewish country and observe Shabbat, but Israeli Jews should be able to determine what that looks like. And that seems to be, although that is not fully the situation in Israel today, but that seems to be more of a direction or more of an option. It's not 20% and 80% in our country, it's probably flipped. 80% of places, people do what, the government dictates what happens, and about 20% of places, people have choices. But more and more, people are working for and fighting for the right to determine, keeping it Jewish, keeping it Shabbat, but having a say in what that looks like. Okay. Oh, no. What surprised you about marriage in Israel? Who was surprised about the mikvah thing? That, that all Jewish women in Israel, if they want to have a Jewish marriage, have to go to the mikvah? Two of you said, so which I would, you, know, you don't have to, I, I would think that that would be pretty surprising. That, that is definitely not the case in America. If you, many rabbis that you go to will teach women about the mikvah, will encourage them, but you certainly don't need to get a certificate saying that you actually went to the mikvah and immersed in the mikvah in order to have a Jewish marriage. Um, again, one of you felt that it's, it's traditional Jewish place, Jewish marriage in Israel. And we're going to see, I hope we get there today, we're going to see that that makes a difference on who gets married to other Jews in Israel as compared to other places. Um, Israel giving a discount to students, that's kind of a nice thing. Um, Jews can only marry other Jews in Israel. That's a pretty surprising thing when I would think when you come from America where you have a lot more options on the table. And okay, none of you were surprised that Jews in Israel, we can't just show up at the rabbinate and say, like, you know, you can in America go to your rabbi and say, okay, I'm here, I want to get married. You have to first prove that you're Jewish and prove that you're single. Okay. Um, Lori, we had um, we had a few people that were really interested in the one that talked about student discounts, mm -hmm. um, and maybe, like guys, stop. <laughs> oh, and maybe like why <laughs> how that started because they why Jordan Jordan unless you had a reaction to that why 
it's like they're forcing you to get married young. So it felt it felt like they were like promoting young marriage and they felt uncomfortable. It's <laughs> Interesting idea, guys, because you think of students as being young. Because in America, you go to college pretty much. If you go, you finish high school at 18 and you go on to college. But Israel's a little bit different. When you finish high school in Israel at 18, you either go on to the army or you go on to national service. Many people take a year or two after the army or national service to travel or to work and to earn some money. So college students in Israel tend to be in their mid-20s to their early 30s. In fact, my son-in-law just right now, like two weeks ago, started university for the first time, and he's 27 years old. And he is by far not the oldest in his class. So students in Israel tend to be a bit older than students in America. And it's a way of the government supporting that people have been in the army or have done national service, have served their country, and now they have to first go and learn so they can go out and get jobs. So it's, it's giving a recognition and a discount to many people, the vast majority of people who come to get married are of that age. And it's expensive. So <laughs> it's, yes, <laughs> go ahead. Let's see it. Okay. Can people in America go to the army in Israel and then go to college after? Yeah. Absolutely. In fact, I have a young man who lives in my house. His name is Yakir. He comes from, well, he was born in Detroit, but he grew up in high school in Teaneck, New Jersey. And he decided to move to Israel and to join the army. He's what's called a lone soldier. And his girlfriend, who is 19, just went into the army. She's, in fact, in an elite, very elite um, uh, he's in the paratroopers, she's in an elite unit of the paratroopers teaching them how to do navigation. And she came here at 18 and went into the army now at 19 and she's also a lone soldier. And they will do their time in the army and then go to university, absolutely. Many lone yeah. soldiers come to the army and then go back to their country, wherever they're from and go to university there. And many stay in Israel, make Aliyah, and go to university here. And it's free for them if they do. Yeah. In Israel, a university is free if you do the army. What? Yeah. No, what? not for Israelis. No, no, no. For lo If you come as a lone soldier and make Aliyah, you get certain right. rights, and university is then free for you. Yeah. Can you go back about. to America? Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Many lone soldiers come, and they decide that they want to be part of the Israeli army and they do army service. And in fact, they don't have to do three years like Israelis. They can come and do an 18 month. It's a special army service for lone soldiers and go back to whatever, to France or to England or to Australia or to America, wherever they come from. Absolutely. Oh. It's going to be cool. It's that's, that's the whole thing. Maybe one time Yakir is here and we have class. I'll ask him if he can sit in a little with us and you guys can ask him some questions about oh. not that much older than you. He's only, well, he just turned 22, but he came here at 19. So he didn't come <laughs> so much older than you. Um, okay, guys. Yes, go ahead. Ask a question. Okay. So usually in the, in the, Questions. It was up. One. It was a couple up. It was Wait. a couple up. Okay. Question. Go up. Wait. Yeah. The government. How they should observe Shabbat. I feel like usually I would say like let people choose, but like for this example, I feel like if we let people choose, then it's not gonna be like as like a Jewish state. Like I feel like it. I don't know, people would like not observe it as much. Yeah. And then there wouldn't be a lot of Jews left. So I feel like it's wow. good that we should have like some people tell us we should observe it. So we can like keep it. I don't know. No, That's it's a, a interesting. very interesting idea. And in fact, that is what some of the leading, even non-religious, some of the leading like community leaders and philosophers and political leaders in the country very much take that position. As well as we have many religious parties in the government who feel that because we're the Jewish country, Shabbat has to mean something. But there's yeah. that 
question. You know, that's why I ask you, what does it mean to live in a Jewish state? There's always that tension between someone determining what Shabbat has to look like, meaning different Jews think of Shabbat as different things. The same thing with marriage. So there's that tension, and it's a struggle, and it's something that Israel society, it's why we say challenges and triumphs. Triumph is that Shabbat in Israel is Shabbat. The schools are closed. People don't have to work. Families get together. 84% of Israeli Jews in one form or the other observe Shabbat. That might mean they go to the beach with their kids or they get together and have a meal. People, Shabbat is an important part of Israelis' lives. But that kind of tension, you hit the nail on the head in how do we make it Shabbat and how do we let people decide what that looks like? And that is the same argument for Shabbat, the same argument for marriage. Many people in Israel want civil marriage. But again, we have Jewish marriage, and it's exactly for the reasons that you said. It, it keeps people Jewish. It makes sure that all Jews in Israel can marry each other. You're going to see at the end of this, what does a Jewish state look like? That is what intermarriage looks like in Israel as compared to America. So it does have an effect. But right. you guys said it when you were asked, how would you feel if the U.S. government told you what your wedding has to look like? So some of you were fine with that, but some of you felt that that would raise problems. And I know Tova said she's planning a wedding now. And part of the joy of planning a wedding is envisioning what your wedding looks like and then bringing that dream to reality. So Israeli Jews struggle with that also. Even many Israeli Jews who want traditional Jewish weddings struggle with the government being involved and telling them what that has to look like. So, okay, great guys. Um, what types of things can Jews go and do on Shabbat? For sure sleep in late because there's no school. They can, just like you guys can in America, they can go to shul and they can pray. Um, they can do whatever they want. In the Somebody said this in the last class, and that's true. In the privacy of their own home, in public, people can do whatever they want. Um, and they can spend time with family and friends. And Shabbat in Israel is a relaxed, fun day um, for most of the country. So... Oh. It is nice. Um, it's Who's been to Israel, guys? Who's been to Israel in the class? No. Nobody? Been no, I've been to Israel, but we didn't do it. Then. Lexi's been to Israel. Lexi's been to right. Israel. Do you remember, do you remember what it was like, Lexi, on Shabbat in Israel? Do you remember like any specific memory about a Shabbat in Israel? They didn't really get to explore. It was an eighth grade trip um, run out of Chicago, and they really just kind of stayed at the hotel. We did, they didn't explore on Shabbat. <laughs> just, yeah. Okay, that in itself is telling you something. They kind of stayed at the hotel because most things are closed. And okay, okay, all right, great. Okay, guys. We, last time we ended by looking at some of the differences in Jewish marriage, and today we're going to look at something which is a far more serious thing. So really, if you really feel so strongly, I think I had said this to you in the last class, if you really feel so strongly that you don't want to marry according to the Rabbanut and according to the Jewish laws, you can leave the country, people fly to Cyprus and have a civil marriage and they come back to Israel and they're registered as married. They're not registered as having had a Jewish marriage, but they're registered as, as being married. So where does the problem really start? I'm going to ask you guys, everybody has their earbuds? Yes. Okay. So the problem starts, you know, we all know everybody gets married and God willing, they're going to be married forever. But we all know that sometimes for many, many reasons, marriages don't work out. And in Judaism, there is a very specific way that Jewish law tells us that we have to get divorced. So I'm going to ask you guys to take a few minutes, plug in your earbuds. You're going to watch this little video about the get, which is a Jewish divorce. What is it? And then guys are going to look at legal divorce in Chicago. 
and what the requirements of divorce. There's an article that you're gonna click into and read about the requirements of divorce in Chicago. So everybody, let's take a few minutes. You're gonna click in, watch this video about Jewish divorce, and then I want you to read this article about legal divorce in Chicago. It's called the Legal Divorce in Chicago. Why is there a video? I start with the video about the get and what it, what it is. So everybody should be watching now. You'll click in. You'll see this little video that looks cute, but it's a very serious subject. So, Although a little in the weeds for those not concerned with halakha, Wait, what happened? 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 Wait, what Hey guys, show me with your hands when you finish watching the video and reading the article and we're ready to move on. Who's finished both? No one yet? Okay, guys, before we move on, and I'm going to ask you guys to take a couple minutes and, and read through quickly an article about this whole issue of the get. I want us to think about some of the really serious things, because this is more than just the government telling people how to get divorced. The reality is that this is an issue which affects Jews in America as well. If a woman wants a divorce, and she doesn't receive a get from her husband. She's called an aguna or a chained woman. Why? Because she can't marry anyone else. Because according to Jewish law, in order for a woman to be divorced, a husband must give the wife, give his wife a get. The woman receives the get, and then she's considered divorced Jewishly. 
And why is it such an issue? It's such an issue because if a woman, a Jewish woman is married and she gets divorced from her husband and she doesn't receive a get, she can never marry anyone else in a Jewish marriage and have children who are considered to be Jewish and are able to be married with other Jews. And it's a very serious issue, not just in America. And the reality is that there are, the Jewish law is that a man cannot be forced to give his wife a get. However, we know that for centuries, there were, communities would beat a man if he didn't give his wife a get, that there was no such thing as a Jewish man holding his wife hostage if she wanted a divorce. And there are many things that the Israeli government does. Their men can have their salaries can be frozen in the bank. They're not allowed to come into synagogue and be part of a minion. Communities are told not to invite them over. Men lose their driver's licenses. Men are put in jail. And communities come out and protest and tells outside the man's home, outside his family's home. So many things happen in the community, but it's a very, very serious issue. So I want you guys quickly to click into this article about the Agonot issue and some of the real things that are happening today. This was a very recent article from the Jerusalem Post, our major English Friday or paper, which is like your Sunday big paper. This was an article from October 21st, so it was really, really recent. And it tells you the kind of things that are going on in this country to do something about this Agona issue. Yeah. Is it on? Yeah. Um, bring up here, give me your iPad. I'll use it. Um, and then put your headphones in the box. Thank you, Gary. And when you finish with the article, I want you guys to click onto this lino board. Oh, we went all ahead here. Fantastic. Great. Um, and I want you to tell me what you think about this get process. How do you feel about all Israeli Jews signing the Jewish prenup, which is something that's talked about in that article? And do you think Israeli divorce helps or hurts the Jewish people? I'll remind you guys to write on the lino. You click on any one of these post-its, and then you can post what you write. And by the way, you should know, I don't remember exactly if the article talked about it, that not only is there the prenup, which today, I mean, most religious Jews in Israel, or many, many religious Jews in Israel, would never let their children get married without signing the prenup. There's also a postnup. If Jews are married, any married couple can go to a rabbi and sign the prenup after they're married. And it's not a prenup like you, as you guys are reading, like you guys think of prenup. It has nothing to do with um, determining anything other than that both people agree that if one person wants to end the marriage, they will end the marriage or they'll face very serious penalties. Lori, have you seen the uh, documentary One of Us on Netflix? I have not. I don't have Netflix. What is, what is One of Us? I'm sorry. It, it just came out. I haven't been able to watch it yet, but I've heard of it. It, um, it talks about divorce in an Orthodox community. Mm -hmm. I have not seen it. I have not seen it, but I can tell you that right now, I'm, I'm almost embarrassed to say this, right now, one, one of my neighbors is, uh, is a woman, a young woman, who wanted to get a divorce. Her husband was not a very balanced man, and it really was necessary that she get a divorce. And her husband is refusing to give her a get. And we've seen all of this acted. And unfortunately, they did not sign a prenup or a postnup. And we've seen all of this activism. There have been many steps already taken against her husband. Um, within the next two weeks, he will be placed in jail if um, he doesn't give her 
I get. And there is a lot of pressure in the community now being directed at him and his family to make that happen. Good. That sucks. I, I, those are great words. Those are great words. There's really no other way to say it. But guys, you know what? This might come as a surprise to you guys, but this isn't just Israel. When it comes to divorce and the get and the aguna situation, unfortunately, that is a worldwide Jewish issue. And it is one of the pressing religious issues of the 21st century because who wrote this? Women should be able to marry whoever they want. Women should be able to decide if they want a divorce. Why do men want to be married to a woman that doesn't love him? For the simple reason, yeah. no woman should be chained or in that situation. We live in a very different world today. Um, and again, like with many religious issues, whether it's the holidays or Shabbat or political process, in Israel, or how we work the land in Israel today, dealing with Jewish law about marriage and divorce are, are very, very pressing real issues that um, intellectuals, scholars, rabbis, Jews in Israel are at the forefront of fighting these battles. But this affects everybody all over the Jewish world. What yeah. do you guys think of this whole idea, which, by the way, exists in America, too? I know most of my friends' children in America are not getting married today. Rabbis won't marry them without their signing a prenup. What do you guys think of the whole prenup, postnup idea? I don't like it. Okay, what I don't like it. You, what okay. is that? One like what about it doesn't. What, what do we like about it? What don't we like about it? Why? Why do we have to like we could be able to marry who we want and divorce if you don't want to? I feel like that doesn't affect anything but the person's happiness. Um, the divorce for sure, but I'm confused as how the prenup. Again, the purpose of the prenup is for both people when they're getting married to say we love and respect each other so much that under any circumstances, even if God forbid things go wrong, under any circumstances, we want to act in a loving and respectful way. And we want to make sure that if one party wants to end the marriage, they have the right to do that. So the-, oh, the then, yeah. Well then, yeah, that's, I think that's good. Doesn't everyone's, I know like, we have that thing like my parents sign, like, not everyone does a pre prenup for Oh, I like that. It's, I think it's like relatively new. It's a new thing. It's a new thing. I would encourage you guys. I mean, Tova's getting married now. I would encourage anybody who gets married in a Jewish wedding to think about signing a, a Jewish prenup. Um, I'll do that. Right. It's funny. I haven't, I haven't even thought about it yet. So it's really interesting to hear about this. No, but if someone's like, like doing bad, like if someone's like, you know, a really bad relationship, then is that okay? What is okay? Like to divorce? Is it because the prenup no. states okay to divorce? No, no, guys, Judaism, in Judaism, divorce is not a sin. We believe that people are human beings, and if there are circumstances that the marriage cannot continue, Judaism, you are, it is okay to get divorced. We certainly believe in marriage and, and, rabbis and rabbinical courts would encourage people to really try to work on their marriage. But we believe that divorce is okay, that there are circumstances where sometimes even divorce is necessary. So absolutely, if somebody is in a bad or abusive marriage, but the problem becomes when somebody needs to get out of a marriage, if a man decides he doesn't want to give his wife a divorce, he can try and not give her a get. And if someone's in a really bad relationship or an abusive relationship, that's when it's more likely that some, a man will hold that over his wife's head and try and punish her with the get. So, um, Tova, I encourage you. It's an important thing to talk about with your rabbi when you plan your wedding um, to, talk about, to talk about the prenup. Um, yeah. A good thing to bring up. Okay, guys.
So I just want you to see this because this is really a new thing that the, this whole idea of this prenup and postnup helping to solve the issue in Israel. And the organization that really promotes the prenup in Israel has found that in 100% of cases which have been brought before the court, the court, the existence of the prenup talks the man out of his initial refusal because he prefers to divorce rather than pay or owe substantial sums of money. So it does work and it has been changing divorce in Israel, especially for those people who sign pre and post nuts. Okay, so next thing I wanna look at and what it means to be, to live in a Jewish state is shared religious spaces, Jews, non-Jews, men, women, and prayer. So I'm gonna ask you guys to click on this slideshow. Everybody should be coming into something that says prayer in Israel. Okay. Can everyone get in? No. I, I'm, I'm running into an issue here. I'm trying to figure it out. <clears throat> okay, you just have to click on slide six. Click on shared religious spaces there, and it will bring you into this slideshow, Prayer in Israel. Okay. Does anybody have any idea what is the holiest place in Israel for Jews? Holiest one with the wall or very close. I don't know. Very close. What is it called? I, I forgot what it was called. But yeah. Laurie, um, the iPads for some reason are ask, making us request access again to the accounts we're supposed to be on. Okay, give me one. So we, let, give me one second. Let me. I'll just double check it and make sure. And if not, we'll look together, and it's okay. Um, okay. 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 You can try it again. Okay, everyone try again. Okay, so the wall was a retaining wall, actually, of the holiest place for Jews in the world, which was the Beit HaMikdash, <laughs> or the temple, which sat above, was sat on the Temple Mount, which is above the Kotel, or the Western Wall, which is the remaining wall. And the Temple Mount, where the temple, or Beit HaMikdash, used to be, is the holiest place in the world for Jews. Does anyone know when the Temple Mount came under Israeli control? When did uh, Israel capture or win the right to the Temple Mount? Nineteen sixty-seven. What happened in nineteen sixty-seven? The temple is in our hands. Har but what happened in 1967, probably Israel's most famous war, its shortest war and most famous war? Six-day war, yeah. Six-day war, right, happened in June of 1967. And the very, very famous radio recording of Rav Shlomo Goren saying, Har Habayat Biyadenu, the Temple Mount is in our hands. So in 1967, Israel finally is able to return, Jews are able to return to the old city to the Temple Mount, and to the Kotel, the Western Wall. So that being the case, how would you guys think that prayer on the Temple Mount should be arranged? These are the choices that I've given you, so I'm gonna ask you guys to vote for one of them. Only Muslims should pray on the Temple Mount. There are two mosques, well, one mosque and one holy place up there. Only Jews should pray on the Temple Mount. Separate prayer times for Muslim Jews and others or separate prayer spaces for mus Muslim Jews and others? Okay, guys, who would vote for A? Only Muslims should pray on the Temple Mount. Nobody. No. Okay, what about B? Only Jews should pray on the Temple Mount. Matthew, you say yeah? Yeah. Okay, we, we have, have one. one for the information to make my decision okay we're going to give you some more i'm putting you on the spot now we're going to get some more information in a minute separate prayer times for muslim jews and others 
Anyone? Separate prayer spaces for Muslim Jews and others. We have a few votes for that one. Yeah, I'll just vote for that. Okay. You guys might think that that's the way it worked out, but Israel made a decision in 1967 to allow the Waqf, which is the Muslim religious authorities, to maintain control of the Temple Mount. And they have forbidden anyone other than Muslims to pray on the Temple Mount. So whereas there are times that Jews and Christians or non-Muslims are allowed to go up and visit certain parts of the Temple Mount, they are not allowed to pray there. And when a Jew goes up to the Temple Mount, they are followed by the Muslim Waqf police, as well as Israeli policemen, and they are not allowed to stand and like silently move their mouths or to take out a prayer book. They're, they're not allowed to in any way look like they're praying on the Temple Mount. And I want us to just watch a short clip to see what often happens on the Temple Mount. And remember, this is the holiest place in the world to Jews. Muslims Mecca is their holiest place. In Jerusalem's old city, Al-Aqsa Mosque and the Dome of the Rock sit squarely on the site that Jews call the Temple Mount and Muslims the Noble Sanctuary. It may be the most contested religious site in the world. Jews widely believe that the first and second temples once stood here. Muslims believe this is a location from where Muhammad ascended to heaven. The 37 acres are controlled by the Islamic Waqf. Prayer by non-Muslims is strictly forbidden. نحن نرحب بزيارة أي شخص غير مسلم كزيارة وليس كحق وليس كعبادة أن يمارس عبادة. Many Jews pray at a remnant of its outer western wall, but refuse to enter based on religious teachings. Like a, like a, almost an act of blasphemy to do it. Um, there are other opinions that you know are much more lenient, but I personally wouldn't go up there. For years, a fringe of far-right-wing Israelis have entered, challenging restrictions to Jewish prayer. Now, more mainstream Jews are visiting. This has some groups worried that any provocation could escalate into a conflict. One such event happened Wednesday when three Muslims were arrested after throwing stones at Jews they thought to be praying at the site. <laughs> Visitors of all religions are generally welcome, but religious Jews must be escorted by Israeli police and a waqf guard who ensure that they do not pray or demonstrate any religious activity. Russian immigrant Max Friedzen visits every morning that he's allowed in. He learned to pray silently without moving his lips in Leningrad in the 1980s. To say I'm praying, it's a little bit unlaw here. I'm thinking about my God. Rabbi Chaim Richman hopes a third temple will eventually be built on the mount. But for now, wishes Jews would have more access to the site. Really, don't confuse the issue. I'm not talking about building a temple. I would like to be able to go without the Muslim guard watching the movement of my lips. And I would like to be able to um, freely worship God uh, by praying. Okay, guys, so that is the reality today of the Temple Mount. Oftentimes when Jews go up, and today many, many Jews go up, families with young children, many people go up, they can be spit at, they can have rocks thrown at them, they certainly can have people chanting and screaming. Um, there are um, oftentimes kids up there playing soccer or playing. It's not treated as such a holy place, a respected place. And the Jews who go up there are frequently 
harassed at best, and certainly not permitted in any way to appear. As that Max Friedson said, you can be, he learned in Moscow, in Leningrad, how to daven and pray without anyone seeing he was praying. You could certainly be there thinking about God or having a conversation with God in your head, but you can't in any way, shape, or form look like you are praying. And in fact, last year, almost about a year ago, last December, UNESCO put forward a vote on whether or not the Temple Mount is Jewish and this whole area is Jewish, the Temple Mount, the Kotel, and they decided in UN Resolution 2334 that no, this is not a Jewish area and we do not have ties to this area. So I want to ask you guys, why do you think it's so complicated? Meaning Muslims pray there. Nobody's telling them they can't pray. If Jews were praying somewhere outside up there, Muslims would be praying there. Jews would be praying there. Christians would be praying there. Why do you think it's so complicated to find a solution for sharing the Temple Mount? Because they think that no, they shouldn't share it. <laughs> They should share it. Why don't they? Why do you think it's so complicated? Why doesn't Israel just come in and say, no, it's a Jewish country? Temple Mount is, is obviously is a Jewish place also. You can pray there, but so can we. Clearly they're causing problems, so why would we share it? Why would we just have this place for each separate? Why don't we do it with the Temple Mount? I'm sorry, why I didn't... You can just have a place for everyone, like the the walls. Separate. They want separate places, they said, because they can't coexist. So it's easier. Why don't we just have separate places for everyone? Okay, why? Why can't we just say, okay, you Jews, the Temple Mount is a very large area. Why can't we say, okay, the Jews will just go over there in that corner, or Christians will go over there, and the Muslims have their mosques, and everybody can pr pray peacefully in their own space. Why do you think it's so complicated? Why do you think we don't have that solution? We just think it belongs well, no matter to us. what, it's a, there's always going to be a problem. I think we should just let them have this one and we can have something else. Okay, that's, what, that's definitely one opinion. If they want it, we could have something else. But the other side of that is that for over 2,000 years, when Jews have been praying to go back to Israel, and Jews have been praying to reestablish their community, their people in Israel, it's really been all about the Temple Mount or the holiest places that are the most important historically, religiously, in every respect to Jews. So there are many people who feel that, no, that is the heart of who we are, that we're nothing without the Temple Mount. But okay, one solution could be just to not care. But that doesn't really answer the question of why you guys think it's so complicated. You came up with some good solutions. We could share the spaces. Why doesn't that happen? Because they don't want to share it. They think it's only for them. Okay. One answer for sure is it is clear. It is clear that the Muslim walk has no interest in sharing. And there's a lot of complicated reasons for that. One is Middle East. Middle East. What else do they need? <laughs> what? They own the rest of the Middle East. What else do they need? Yeah, they don't know. You know what? According to their religion, according to their religion, it's a very big issue and a very big deal that Jews or Christians or lesser people religiously than Muslim than Muslims would have control of what they consider to be Islamic lands. And there's religious connotations to that as well as political connotations. But okay, so in this case, Israel is dealing with an other, meaning Israel walks that balance of having to work with the Muslim waqf as well as the larger Islamic community that would be up in arms that, I don't know if you guys follow the, the news, a few months ago over the summer when there was a terror attack on the Temple Mount, when two Israeli policemen were murdered by terrorists who were able to hide guns in the mosques there and then come in and murder people. And Israel 
put uh, metal detectors, not on the Temple Mounts, but on the, the gates on the entrance to the Temple Mount. And there's an entrance, the main entrance, that only Muslims are allowed to go in. Jews and Christians aren't allowed to go in that entrance. And they put metal detectors there. And there were riots all over the Muslim world, including in Jerusalem, because people were so angry that the Israeli police or the Israeli government would try and control what happened in any way on the Temple Mount. So Israel has to deal with the rest of the world and a lot of political pressures when trying to figure out a solution for the Temple Mount. And for now, for today, Jews can go up, Christians can go up and visit, but they don't have the right to pray. We have a whole nother issue of prayer. Some of you guys said before the wall, the wall being the most important part, the Western wall where Jews come to pray. So Lexi, you were in Israel. Do you remember going to the Kotel? Yeah. Okay, what did it look like to you when you went to the Kotel? Mm. I don't know. Do you remember, do you not remember that at the Kotel, there's a big machitza or divider and there's a men's section where only men can go and pray and there's a women's section. I remember that, but I didn't have a problem with it. Okay. Just to respect the rules. Oh, now I'm warning up my headphones. Oh, no. Okay. You, uh, you, that's wonderful. And that's, I'm going to ask you guys to look at some information because there are people, Israeli Jews as well as Jews in the rest of the world, who do not pray in an Orthodox synagogue and would <laughs> like to be able to go to the Kotel, which is such an important place for Jews around the world and would like to be able to pray there. So I want you guys, well, we're actually not gonna have time to get into that tonight. We're gonna pick up with this next week. We're gonna look at the whole issue of what does prayer look like at the Kotel. And this is a place that Israel doesn't have to worry about the rest of the world or the Muslim world. This is again, an internal Jewish argument about what prayer looks like at the Kotel. And we're, go we're going to pick up with that for now. We're going to end class. I see that we are running out of time. We're going to pick up with that next week and look at what does it mean to be in a Jewish country in terms of Jewish prayer. Okay, guys, thank you very much awesome. for being with me today. Um, and I will see you next week. Thank you.